It's uh, an incredible honor to be here, and uh, uh, I really want to thank um, Victoria Sims for giving me this tremendous opportunity um, to be speaking alongside with uh, some of the big heroes and heroines of uh, uh, my academic uh, journey is really a very special experience. I'm also um, chief executive of the Anna Freud Center, uh, which is uh, a mental health charity that actually looked after uh, many of the, under Anna Freud, many of the children from the kinder transport uh, that uh, uh, we heard so much about from Mona and uh, uh, indirectly from her mother, Lisa. There's a lot been talked about so far about the quality that uh, relationship between parent and uh, child brings uh, and uh, uh, the unique humanity uh, of uh, human childcare that uh, uh, Ruth and Dr. Fox has talked about um, is, I think, uh, perhaps best summarized in the concept of mentalizing. Because what makes us genuinely different from uh, other mammals is our capacity to discern whether an action is performed intentionally on purpose because of a thought, a feeling, a belief, a desire that underpins it, or it's serendipitous, or it's an accident. If I drop this, uh, which I try and do carefully, I don't think any of you thought that I did that by accident. I don't think any of you needed to think that I might have done that by accident. But uh, uh, even very intelligent primates would find it hard to discern that an action was uh, due to chance uh, or not. But I'm about to use Simon Baron Cohen's test to uh, examine your capacity to mentalize. And uh, I would like you to, just to yourself, uh, whether that those eyes express friendship, sadness, surprise, or being worried? Friend is the correct answer. Okay, what about surprised, sure about something, joking, or happy? Very good. Uh, and what about joking, flustered, desire, or convinced? That is a very interesting uh, gender difference on this. <laughs> Women notice that is desire, but men fail to. <laughs> that there is potentially a problem there that uh, <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, but what, what I do want to emphasize, however, is that oxytocin that uh, 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 Ruth uh, Feldman talked about so eloquently actually acts as a neuropeptide that enhances the individual's capacity to mentalize. They perform better on, for example, the reading the mind in the eyes test with a little sniff of oxytocin. Uh, it's a bit like kind of Viagra for mentalizing, really. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, you don't need to worry. You can get it on the oxytocin. You can get it on the internet. Uh, so, you know, it has, it takes about 30 45 minutes to come, become active. And it has a half-life that's relatively short. But if you ever want to have a serious discussion with your partner, I would strongly recommend that you use a little bit of oxytocin. You get them to sniff it. About 30 minutes later, they sniff a bit of oxytocin. It passes the problem. And you say, OK, now look in my eyes. OK. <laughs> now, let's have this discussion about the washing up. <laughs> OK. Um, I, I think I'll rapidly move on from here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, in a relationship context, what, what does good mentalizing achieve for an individual? Um, and what does a person whose capacity to mentalize is better look like? But that person is relaxed, flexible, it's not stuck to one point of view. They can be playful, uh, with humor that engages rather than hurting. Uh, or distracting, they can solve problems, they can give and take between their own and other people's perspectives. They describe their own experience uh, rather than defining other people's experience or, or intentions. It 
also is characterized by somebody who can convey uh, their behavior uh, rather than a sense of what happens to them. They uh, take things and own them. Uh, it's uh, someone who is able to be curious about other people's perspectives and uh, expect uh, uh, that their own views uh, uh, are extended, not necessarily adopted, but can uh, uh, be extended to others. It's a person who is tentative, who is reflective, who takes perspectives, who forgives, who is trusting, who is, uh, has humility and who is playful, uh, self-mocking humor, uh, may as assuming responsibility and serving a sense of autobiographical continuity of knowing one's past and how one's got to where one has and how where one is heading to. We are all like that, aren't we? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not, but you all are. Uh, um, so uh, at this point, I want to introduce you to a, a personal uh, trauma. Um, now, the, the, none of you will recognize this. Not, that's that's uh, uh, Robert Greene, whose name shall live in infamy in British soccer, because we were uh, about uh, a decade ago playing um, the United States in uh, the World Cup in South Africa, and uh, it was a game that we drew against the United States. The shame for every Englishman. <laughs> you, <laughs> You guys haven't started playing soccer in like 10 years ago or something like that. <laughs> we played it, we discovered the wretched game, you know. Uh, anyway, this guy, Robert Green, he um, led this goal. I used to be a goalie, that wasn't a very good one, but one of the things that you learn as a goalie that you, you, know, you always keep your body between the ball and the net behind you. And, and this guy was just kind of, and it went, the ball went through his hands. That's what you can see there. It was miserable. <laughs> That's what he looked like. Uh, was he upset, <laughs> angry, <laughs> disappointed, or frustrated? <laughs> you can. But that's not why I'm showing you uh, this, this picture. I wanted to show you the uh, British fans mentalizing. <laughs> uh, now, uh, there is a brain reason behind this, and, and the reason uh, is that the parts of the brain that we now, and uh, Ruth Feldman talked about, is the mentalizing network. The parts of the mentalizing network that gets activated in relation to one's own feelings is the very same bit of the brain that one uh, that's activated, that's recruited uh, to envision other people's feelings. So it's the medial prefrontal cortex, and what you can see there is the white area uh, where the two uh, overlap, the self-mentalizing and other mentalizing overlap, also overlap in the temporoparietal junction, the precuneus, and the anterior temporal um, lobe. So there's an overlap in, in self and other. And why is that important? That's important because uh, it suggests something about the intersubjective origins of our sense of ourselves. Uh, that initially we find our mind in the minds of our parents. And later, other attachment figures perhaps thinking about us. That the parent's capacity to mirror effectively her child's internal state is at the heart of affect regulation and self-understanding. That the infant is crucially dependent on the contingent response of a caregiver, which in turn depends on her capacity to be able to be reflective about her child's uh, psychological state. And the failure to find one's constitutional self as a baby in the mind of the other will lead to potentially profound uh, distortions of the self-representation. So an exaggerated mirroring of one's anxiety could lead one with something that aggravates that anxiety rather than soothes it. And of course, as uh, uh, Dr. Lieberman's presentation, Alicia's presentation so clearly identified, the same process is at work in therapeutic relationship. So, where is mentalization learned? Mentalization is learned in the family. Now, that's my family there. Uh, the chap at the back is my dad, my mom, 
next to me is my sister, and the chap with the ball is me. And uh, that's me saying, I want to write my PhD on the use of low noise signal to noise ratio stimuli for highlighting functional differences between the two cerebral hemispheres. But I don't know why people laugh at this. It's the title of my PhD. And whereas my dad saying, you'll never amount to anything if you hold a ball like that. Uh, and that's, that's my mum mentalizing as ever, let the boy dream Ivan, he's a born dilettante. And that my sister saying, you look smug now, but you will lose your hair just like that. Uh, the, the quality of my relationship with it hasn't changed over the years. Anyway. Uh, so uh, what is learned uh, in the context of the attachment relationship is uh, actually um, uh, how uh, we can understand ourselves. At birth, the baby requires a caregiver or caregivers to accurately understand and respond to their emotional states. But it's not enough to be accurate. You also have to be in a way accurate, but also inaccurate. Because if you're too accurate, then that will uh, obviously uh, undermine the baby's capacity to self-regulate. If, if a caregiver responds by crying to the baby's crying, that's not going to soothe the baby. <laughs> so what uh, I'm trying to illustrate here is what unmarked mirroring looks like. Uh, and what you need the be able to do to a baby is to mark, show marked mirroring, where you show that you're experiencing something that they are experiencing, yes, but you're not fully experiencing it. So this is an illustration of marked mirroring. It's my best attempt, you know. <laughs> I should have had my wife, who's really much better at this, uh, but she wouldn't agree for her photograph to be used in this way. I don't know quite why. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, um, what the parent forms uh, an internal representation of the infant as an intentional being, which is then internalized by the infant and becomes a secondary representation in the uh, infant's mind. And that's um, something that is critical um, if uh, we are going to be able to deal with negative effects in particular, because if what is mirrored by our experience of anxiety, our fear, is more anxiety and more fear from our caregiver. Or what's experienced, uh, what we experience is when we feel sad, is our caregiver looking simply very distressed. That's not going to create an adequate second order representation of what we are feeling. And the beautiful study with uh, Lane Strahern uh, that uh, has shown uh, much of this uh, beautifully is how in mothers insecure in their own attachment when they are um, uh, playing with their kid actually have less oxytocin, less serum oxytocin floating uh, around. They perhaps have less understanding uh, of their baby, but uh, uh, when they see the baby's face in the scanner as sad, actually they have a, a lower activation of the, ins, of the uh, uh, dopaminergic pathways uh, of pleasure, uh, the attachment system, and a stronger activation of the insula associated with negative effect. When they see their baby sad, they feel sad. A secure mum, when the, she looks at her baby being sad, she still feels, this is my baby. I wonder why she's sad. And that is a, a, a tremendously uh, important difference. So what have we found? We found that mothers mentalizing her own childhood before the birth of her child predicts the child's security of attachment. This is mediated by her capacity to mentalize the child, which in turn predicts her capacity to respond to the child's intentions, not to take it personally. And in turn, 
being responded to in a mentalizing way enhances the child's understanding of the intentions of others, creates a reflective part of the self. Twin studies that we have done show that this is not a genetic process that's passed on from one set of genes to another, but it does depend critically on the sensitivity that the mother shows. It is something that exists at the level of the brain. And more recently, a beautiful study of sensitivity was uh, carried out by uh, uh, colleagues in, um, uh, in the Netherlands, showing that sensitive parenting in the first three years of life actually predicts, in a structural magnetic resonance imaging study, it predicts brain development, particularly larger gray matter volume and total brain volume uh, for both mothers and fathers, although for fathers, unfortunately, uh, for the reasons that uh, Ruth Feldman clearly explained, it's not quite significant in that particular study. But uh, nevertheless, parental sensitivity actually directly helps build the brain. At this point, and to end, I want to turn to a sadder part of our story. The kind of experiences that our children have is not actually historically typical. Infanticide actually ran at somewhere like 30 to 40% in 19th century Milan. Currently in Brazilian ghettos, mothers can actually uh, give up on their babies. And detach from them if they think that baby isn't going to survive. We are doing a study in Ethiopia where we are finding exactly the same phenomena that mothers are actually losing the attachment relationship to their baby if the baby is uh, likely to uh, not survive because of malnourishment. So different social environments are likely to trigger different attachment styles. That attachment styles that concern others, that interface with others, that link us closer to others, such as mentalizing, is not necessarily a good thing for children to have if their experience is like that of Joel that uh, Dr. Lieberman was uh, identifying. If my experience of my caregiver is one that I can expect frank maltreatment from, because underpinning that is something that I cannot differentiate from someone wishing to harm me. It is better for me not to go there, not to think about her mental state, but try and manage on my own. And that will equip me for the rest of my life not to trust, not to be there for other people, and not allow other people to be there for me. And the thought that I would like to leave you with is something that we've only recently discovered. That about 300,000 years ago, evolution took an important new turn. It switched from basing itself from a transmission of, of knowledge by genes to transmission of knowledge by culture. But that raises a massively important question for each of us, for each of us as babies. Who is it that we can trust out there? Whose knowledge can we trust? If I have to learn everything from those around me, uh, I need to be able to discern who it is that I can trust. And the biological mechanism for this is set up at a very early age. It is triggered by communication cues communication cues that also trigger attachment. It is somebody there who is reacting to me as an agent, who is reacting to me as a self, who is taking an interest in me. Then I will know that I can trust that person. And then I will know that I can turn to others as well to learn from. So, Part of what's so important 
about the first three years of life is setting up that attitude of trust that a child can have towards the social world around them, because it's from the social world that they will learn how to be human beings. Thank you. <laughs>